symposium. Um, um, this is uh, the Paul Wood uh, Professorship Lecture, uh, keynote lecture, and I'm uh, thrilled that this year we're honored to have uh, Professor Thomas Lusser uh, giving um, uh, uh, this presentation. I will say just a few things uh, about Thomas. Uh, I could spend a lot of time, but uh, he's uh, a graduate of uh, the Zurich Medical School, who spent some time at the Mayo Clinic, important years, came back to Zurich uh, uh, in a chair initially in Basel, then in uh, Bern, and then eventually became the chief of uh, uh, cardiology um, at the Zurich University, prestigious uh, uh, department. Um, over the last few years, uh, Thomas uh, uh, has uh, a position with us in London um, as a consultant colleague and uh, director of research, education and development of the Royal Brompton and Hereford NHS Trust, while he maintains his position as a director of, uh, for Center of Molecular Cardiology at the University of Zurich. Uh, Amongst his um, multiple achievements and contributions, he mentored and trained uh, uh, a large number of young physicians and scientists who practice uh, cardiovascular medicine around the world. His research is translational uh, in nature and has done a lot of work on endothelium. It's published extensively. Thomas uh, is uh, one of the very top uh, um, cited scientists uh, worldwide and um, he has done a fantastic job with the European Heart Journal for 11 years that was a job uh, every day every week every month no no stop and uh, uh, wonderful to have him as a consultant colleague here at Brompton um, Thomas uh, presentation uh, today is uh, highly relevant to the focus of our meeting, uh, the secret of success of heart failure therapy. And um, uh, I wouldn't put a question, but the lessons for ACSD. Thomas, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's a great honor uh, to give this lecture. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Do you see my slides? Thomas. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So I would start with a very simple uh, distinction, and that is lumping and splitting. These are the two approaches in medicine. And as you will see, this uh, is a, some difference, an important difference between heart failure and adult uh, congenital heart disease. I wrote a, a little piece on that, uh, uh, as this is, uh, as I call it, the bumpy road to precision medicine. It all started in 1837 and has not stopped ever since. It was a paradigmatic dispute between uh, the first statistician, Pierre Charles Louis, uh, who uh, was essential uh, for discovery of cholera as an uh, infectious disease and uh, described how this evolved in Paris and how hygiene uh, would ban it. And so he said, ce sont les nombres qui compte, it's the numbers that count. And his counterpart was quite different. Not only in name, Rosueno Damador was focusing on the patient. And he said, if you would know uh, the uh, size of a shoe of a Frenchman, uh, you would not uh, know whether it would fit to any other. So l'homme moyen n'existe pas. And of course, the mean values are that what statisticians work on. So probably we need the, the yin-yang principle of these two extremes to look at this. So there is eminence-based medicine, and that's uh, certainly uh, more the patient-oriented approach that he uh, uh, focused, while uh, Lewis was more the evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is clinical judgment, experience, also clinical vision. It's very selective and looks at the individual patient. By evidence-based medicine, as large populations, avoid selection and indication bias, and of course, later on, also used randomization. In congenital heart disease, it all started with surgery, but initially the surgeons were not pleased to look at the heart. In fact, uh, Theodore Billroth, the famous surgeon and chairman in uh, 
Zurich and then later in Vienna said a surgeon who tries to sue a wound of the heart will lose forever all respect from his colleagues. But fortunately, some pioneers didn't listen to that. And uh, this is the first pioneer. On August uh, 8th, as you all know, 1938, the surgeon Robert Edward Gross for the first time successfully ligated a persistent ductus arteriosus. And this was an extra cardiac operation and therefore the risk was much lower at that point in time. And then came another extra uh, cardiac operation, the Blalock Tausig shunt uh, in 1944. And the first uh, person that dared uh, to open the heart was uh, this man, uh, uh, F. Uh, John Lewis, who on September 2, 1952, for the first time openly closed an atrial septal defect in a five-year-old girl under hypothermia with closed flow. And then eventually, I have to mention that coming from Zurich, our Kassening, from the Karolinska, later in Zurich, and uh, uh, William Mustard, they developed the transposition of the great arteries, operations that are, of course, less important today because we have other options today, but still, these are pioneers for sure. So eminence-based medicine is important, but also eminent physicians may be wrong. This is one example, and I will come back to him, Paul Dudley White, the Braunwald of uh, the 1930s said, hypertension may be a, an important compensatory mechanism which should not be tempered with, even where it's certain that we could control it. So today, obviously we think differently. So let me uh, now uh, go through a few points, splitting and lumping, then the success of lumping, this discovery of different forms of heart failure, and how splitting also in half pef uh, is the new frontier. And then conclude with a few other examples. Let's first look at splitting and lo or lumping. What is better here? Well, from unity to the diversity, you can lump and you say heart failure are all alike. Or you can split and we come back to that, what ends up in this spectrum. But there are certainly multiple forms of heart failure, as we all know today. So the success of lumping is really important because it's counterintuitive that you put everything together like a potpourri, as the French would say, and you call it half ref heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It started, of course, with an eminent uh, English uh, physician, William Withering, and he learned from Mother Hutton to treat dropsy, what he called dropsy, and that we know is decompensated heart failure today, probably. But we didn't make much progress for a long time. Another eminent English physician, Sir Maurice Cassidy, said in his textbook, uh, uh, in the treatment uh, in general practice of heart failure, uh, uh, in the treatment of congestive heart failure, absolute rest, mental and physical, is of fundamental importance, exactly the country, what we do today. So the first step was actually to focus on ischemic uh, heart failure without even making a difference to dilated cardiomyopathy. But obviously, HFREF, as you see on the right, after a STEMI in the LED territory, for instance, is, of course, the most common form of heart failure, unfavorable outcome, lots of events to uh, prevent, dominating data from randomized trial, and now declining in incidence due to primary PCI. There are other forms of heart failure like this uh, patient with non-compaction. This was a very young lady I saw in neurology because he, she had a stroke and you can see the thrombus in her left ventricle. And so this uh, obviously is, has nothing to do with ischemia and is a completely different disease, but they were lumped all together. And these are the seminal HFREF trials that you all know for. And the first one was consensus. Uh, it was an alapril versus placebo. You can see the amazing re reduction in uh, event uh, and uh, probability of death, in fact, uh, with uh, an, al an alapril in uh, uh, patients with severe heart failure. Then counterintuitively, carvedilol, a beta blocker was used. And indeed, initially, as a fellow, uh, my boss said, are you crazy to prescribe a beta blocker? But then uh, it is clear that 
that against all odds, this reduced uh, survi uh, improved survival further. And in fact, at the end, also rails showed that spironolactone would work as well. So initially, lumping ischemic and dilated cardiomyopathy together proved highly successful. All hefref are alike is a non. Uh, it's, it's a it's a it's a, com a statement that we would not subscribe to today. But initially, it was essential for the progress in this field. And so, why did they actually uh, use uh, an ejection fraction of less than forty or less than thirty-five? It was very simple. It was not uh, anything that had to do with heart failure as such, because it assures a good event rate in trials, and trialists want to have good results. There was no physiological uh, reason behind it, but it worked. Now, left ventricular ejection fraction, obviously, as many biological parameters, is a continuum. It starts from 60 and goes down to 20 or a bit below, and then, of course, usually it does not longer work and uh, patients with disease under these uh, conditions. And if you look at what we define as HEF-REF in the uh, ESC guidelines, it's actually quite arbitrary because indeed mortality, all-cause mortality in this instance starts much earlier. So we should actually uh, look at heart failure with reduced ejection fraction below 60, as I will uh, reiterate in a moment. So these are just examples how much progress we made. First with uh, ACE inhibitors, this is just for sudden deaths, then with beta blockers and eventually with epleronone, the other, uh, uh, the, the brother of spironolactone, uh, a decrease that was just amazing under these conditions. So today we have even more. We have, of course, uh, we have, um, uh, ACE inhibitors, ARNIs, we have diuretics, we have beta blockers, spironolactone, and now also a diabetic drug for diabetics and patients with heart failure, even those without diabetes. But then the first step to splitting started. Pure restoration above 130, one thought that indeed uh, the dyssynchrony of the heart, the electrical dyssynchrony could be reversed by biventricular pacing. And indeed, uh, in some patients, this works amazingly, such as in this one that I saw a couple months after emplacement of a, a CRT. And this is, uh, of course, a super responder, which usually are more likely to be dilated uh, in uh, nature rather than ischemic. But let's move on to dilated cardiomyopathy, the next splitting in uh, the progress of heart failure. Suddenly we discovered that patients that have normal coronary arteries are sort of a different disease. And some of them have actually very good prognosis, others a more fierce one. Some have pump failure, other have uh, uh, sudden deaths. And so the question was, why is this? And here comes genetics. And this is the atlas of the clinical genetics of human dilated cardiomyopathy that we published in the European Heart Journal, which is a huge uh, number of authors as is common practice in genetics. And here you can see that different uh, gene mutations cause different diseases. In fact, sometimes the same genetic mutation can cause different di forms of dilated cardiomyopathy, which initially is counterintuitive, but now since we understand epigenetics, is, is uh, uh, quite logical. But in principle, we learned that numerous genes can cause the same phenotype. And the same phenotype may not be the same prognosis. That's very important. And therefore, in cardiomyopathy, genetics and fibrosis are more important than ejection fraction for clinical outcome. You may have an ejection fraction of 35, but an unfavorable genetic mutation so splitting is the future in dilated cardiomyopathy of HEF-REF. This is just one example. Titan cardiomyopathy leads to altered mitochondrial energetics, increased fibrosis, and long-term life-threatening arrhythmias. And this truncated TNT mutation, TNN mutation, leads to this form of cardiomyopathy. You see on the left, the fibrosis, on the right, the uh, uh, dysfunction of the mitochondrium, and eventually, 
This is associated, as we would expect, because of uh, the fibrosis, uh, uh, the, uh, of a risk with ventricular arrhythmias. So from unit to diversity and cardiomyopathies, we learned that lumping initially is fine, but splitting then really makes a difference and leads us uh, from heart failure as a big entity to a more personalized approach where we can distinguish between ischemic cardiomyopathy, where we have maybe more revascularization procedures uh, that are still also, of course, up uh, uh, on uh, on stage for future trials, dilated cardiomyopathy with genetic car characterization, hypertrophic, restrictive, uh, then also uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, non-compaction, and Takotsubo syndrome. So let me move to the next question. What is wrong with ejection fraction if uh, that is not the only uh, measure uh, for uh, assessing patients and deciding on treatment strategies? Well, left ventricular ejection fraction measures volumes. It does not really measure cardiac performance. Mitral regurgitation in particular leads to overestimation of left ventricular ejection fraction and reproducibility of LVEF is in general poor in echo, less so with MRI, obviously. And longitudinal strain may be better in the future. And this is just an example of a patient that looks not so bad when you look at the left ventricle. But as you can see, this massive mitral regurgitation shows that most of this volumes goes in a low resistance chamber. And therefore, we markedly overestimate the mechanical performance of the left ventricle. But then we discovered a new form of uh, uh, heart failure, and that's half PEF. Uh, um, this is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, as you all know. And of course, we have half path on the left with normal ejection fraction. And then on the right, we have those with reduced ejection fraction. And that, of course, uh, then we have a middle uh, child that was completely artificial because the trial is uh, selected 40%, as I mentioned earlier. So. This criteria published in 2016 have to be rethought when the next guidelines will come on on heart failure because have ref and have mref, which is sort of uh, as if you were stuttering, if you explain that to your grandmother, is really the same as we will see in a moment. And have pef is a real different entity. What is interesting is that in the Framingham study, an echocardiographic uh, project that lasted three decades showed that since we are an aging society in the US, but also in Europe and uh, in, in, the, in the UK, which is no longer Europe, but has the same probably genetic background and the same aging structure, we see that from the first to the third decade, left ventricular ejection fraction of the general population increases. So HEF-PEF uh, is in part an aging process. And of course, we see also that also in HEF-REF, uh, the ejection fractions increase because of primary PCI. So the disease evolves differently as we interfere with it. So what is actually half PEF? You see here a patient uh, with marked left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, with pulmonary congestion and pleural effusion. And is this just an old heart? Is it hypertensive heart disease? Is it diabetic cardiomyopathy, microvascular dysfunction, inflammatory cardiomyopathy with fibrosis, or just a mixed bag? And the answer is, we're not sure yet. It, we know that it's a large left atrium, it's a small ventricle, high ejection fraction, increased left ventricle and anti-stolic pressures, and of course, uh, mildly increased BNP, not as much as in half ref and patients complain of dyspnea and exercise intolerance. What we know, however, if we put everything together, that may be a mixed bag as well, that we learn that also here, outcomes is not favorable. So HEF-PEF has a better outcome than HEF-REF, but it's much uh, less favorable than in the general healthy population. So it is a disease in a way, but we don't know yet what. So 
what works uh, uh, in have PEF? Let's look at this. First of all, uh, what is the mortality? We looked at the left part of this slide, but now let me focus on what the uh, ESC guidelines currently call uh, have PEF, which is from 50 to above 60. But in truth, this is not what it is, because if you look at the mortality, you can see that mortality increases only around 65 to 70 percent ejection fraction. And the sweet spot you want to have to be healthy is actually 60 percent. And no wonder if we don't even know what it is that drugs don't work. And uh, there have many drugs have been used, uh, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin blockers, you name it. And most recently, uh, the spironolactone uh, in uh, the top cat trial in the US with uh, Scott Solomon, Mark Pfeffer and Bertram Pitt. And here we published in the European Heart Journal the uh, uh, sub-analysis which looked at ejection fraction. And if you look at the primary outcome on the top left panel, you can easily see that spironolactone only works as we move towards lower ejection fractions, but may be actually harmful in those with higher ejection fraction. And more recently, we had uh, the trial with the Arni uh, uh, sarcopetrel uh, valsartan, and uh, here, which, where we inhibit angiotensin and neprilysin. And here you can see that overall it was not effective in HEFPEF, but what we could see again here down below in red, that those with low ejection fraction, there it worked. So they're clearly distinct animals. We have PEF and have REF. In half REF, no matter what ejection fraction you have, if it's lower than 60, you would benefit. If it's above 60, you don't. So we can redefine this uh, splitting that initially was helpful, but now I think is no longer the case. 60 is the sweet spot. And what we call half PEF is really 65 or higher with symptoms. And what is below 60% is actually have REF, be it mild, moderate, or severe. And have REF is a tongue breaker that we better leave out. So can we split also in have PEF to move further now that we know that we are sort of stuck uh, with this disease process? And of course, there are comorbidities that are important, hypertensive heart disease, left ventricular hypertrophy in response to high blood pressure stiffens the heart. It, uh, high blood pressure increases left ventricular and diastolic pressure and pulmonary pressure and therefore causes symptoms like dyspnea and exercise intolerance. An antihypertensive therapy might help. And of course, the outcomes are still a debate, but we know from the LIFE trial that angiotensin blockers would probably help, as will ACE inhibitors in this context. But there's another very special form of half path, and that's amyloid heart disease that you see here with the typical spectrum of speckled myocardium, second valves, and large atria, as you can see here in this echocardiography. Made huge progress in the ATTR ACT study it published in the New England Journal two years ago. Uh, we had an amazing result that needed patience because it took time to get rid of the amyloid out of the myocardium. But after 18 months, the curves between uh, the uh, Tafamidis pooled uh, patient group and placebo started to separate. And here we look at survival, like in the old trials, with have ref So this is progress. And here we could find a, a splitting that worked very well. Now, what about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? As you can see in the senior loop, these are really poor uh, patients with huge uh, hypertrophy, small ventricles, and of course, accordingly, SAM, as you can see easily, large atria, then sometimes atrial fibrillation, which makes things worse. And these are young subjects that uh, suffer a lot from the disease and also have a risk of sudden cardiac death, particularly if they have delayed enhancement with fibrosis formation due to microvascular dysfunction, as Paolo Camici showed a decade ago. But here we made also progress, at least in diagnosis, 
uh, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We have a number of genetic mutations that are associated with the disease process. And we have no tool yet, but I will show you the, the light at the end of the tunnel at the end of my talk. Let me just show you another Ladies example that's close to my heart. The United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. So this we is President Eisenhower, a couple of years after his first myocardial infarction that he suffered from in 1956. And I was privileged with my friend uh, Franz Messerly to publish this case report in the New England Journal 50 years later. Uh, we called it the Eisenhower's billion dollar heart attack because of course the stock market uh, at Wall Street plumbed it uh, as much as in 29. Uh, in an amazing uh, uh, reaction to this event. According to his diary, Snyder gave Eisenhower an amyl nitrate to sniff and sequentially injected papaverin and morphine. The patient fell into deep sleep, not to awaken until 11 a.m. His chest pain persisted, however, and an ECG was brought over from Fitch, uh, Son, uh, Simon's uh, Army Hospital. It recorded an anterolateral acute myocardial infarction, as we see here. And the president was hospitalized. More than 24 hours had delay, uh, elapsed since the onset of his first symptoms. And I always say uh, this was really, today would be uh, a, uh, a real uh, uh, mismanagement uh, of uh, uh, an acute myocardial infarction, but at the time, this is what happened because physicians were not prepared to do this. And here are the physicians, Paul Dudley White in front explaining the press what happened, but didn't do much either. And Solomon Snyder on the right, his personal physician that worked it, waited 24 hours to send him to the hospital. Today, he would be sent to jail in America, not only because of that, because also of his deep knowledge on prevention. So this is what happened since. And you can see here also, we had a huge progress due to simple randomized trials, first eminence-based as in adult congenital heart disease. We didn't need for, uh, for cardioversion or for uh, um, a resuscitation uh, with uh, uh, electrical current as developed by uh, Professor Zoll from Harvard. We didn't need a uh, a uh, randomized trial. You don't need a randomized trial to show that parachutes work and the same, you don't need this for defibrillation. But then it was important to show that an angiography with thrombolysis and later primary PCI, be it with femoral and later radial approach, was actually most effective. And these trials showed that we can really markedly reduce mortality in acute myocardial infarction from about 50% when Eisenhower had his heart attack to currently 10%. And you can see that the curve flattens because we have now splitting out a disease that's called cardiogenic shock or a syndrome rather that is still very difficult to treat and is the uh, frontier for the next couple of years. So from unity to diversity is the same here. In Eisenhower's time, which is called it a heart attack. And th this was eminence based. And the eminence, of course, was Paul Dudley White commenting after the event had happened. But today we have STEMI, we have non STEMI, we have plaque rupture leading to STEMI or non STEMI or erosion. We have uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. We have Taku uh, Takotsubo syndrome. We have minocom, myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary artery disease, and we have myocarditis. So we're moving towards precision medicine as well. So what can we learn from that? Well, first of all, pharmacological therapy now and all congenital heart disease, as our chairman wrote some years ago in the European Heart Journal, is a growing need but the evidence is limited. And uh, they put together a nice figure showing where we need drugs in these patient groups and in how few situations do we have evidence. So the first lesson is adult co uh, congenital heart disease is lagging behind in evidence compared to heart failure and acute coronary syndromes. 
Lesson two, also rare diseases need big numbers to understand the disease, large registries with thousands of patients with follow-up. We did this, for instance, with Takotsubo stress cardiomyopathy in New England some years ago with Christian Templin, and you could see that we could characterize that this actually was a bad disease at presentation with a 4% mortality, but an ongoing MACE rate over the next decade. So this is really important to understand the disease. And there is progress. Also rare diseases in congenital heart disease need big numbers, not as big maybe as the one I just showed you, but the current therapy and outcome of Eisenmenger syndrome from the German National Re Registry of Congenital Heart Disease that uh, Gerhard Diller published in our journal also provided important information about the survival probability uh, uh, in these patients. Another uh, example comes also from Gerard Paudin working with Michael Gatsoulis, and that's the new, the new gadget, is machine learning. Machine learning can put things together like lumping, but it's thus splitting on its own with deep learning, eventually comes up with personalized risk scores for patients with uh, rock curves that are amazing and are, uh, can predict uh, the, the need for ACE inhibition or anticoagulation therapy. So I think that's a big uh, progress in this context. Indeed, the future of cardiology is machine learning in many instances. As we move into genetic uh, information, the genetic information is so huge and modulated by epigenetics that our brain is not big enough to handle it. And then come scores that use lots of different variables that we can hardly remember. Imaging with many, many different uh, uh, calculations, parameters, and scores. And eventually, if the patient comes uh, into the acute setting, then of course, uh, lots of other parameters will uh, also uh, be uh, uh, used. And this, of course, also applies for the outpatient setting. And this is not a, 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 a black future. No, this uh, robot, or if you want, helps us and provides us with data sets. And it still needs a physician with clinical judgment. But the judgment is based on much more solid data. Lesson three, random cells are possible also in, acute, in uh, adult uh, congenital heart disease. This is just one example from Nazareno Gallier from Bologna on bosotan therapy in patients with Eisenmenger syndrome. Small numbers, but it's a, it's, it's a breakthrough because it shows that the six minutes walk the distance change from baseline was favorably affected by uh, bosentan. And this is not self-understood because uh, endothelial antagonist, as we have shown, does not work well in heart failure, unfortunately. And what is the future? Well, the future, particularly for genetic diseases, may be exchanging genes. And these are the two ladies that uh, were crucial for the development of CRISPR-Cas, the gene scissor, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. And what they did, of course, they showed us that we can actually change genes in these cells that you show here. And this has been taken up recently in a Nature uh, article uh, from uh, Portland by uh, uh, Dr. Mitalopov, and they uh, actually corrected a pathogenic gene mutation in human embryos that is important for congenital heart disease, and that is a mutation in uh, the um, uh, myosin uh, uh, the light chain a gene uh, causing cardiomyopathy, and with using uh, CRISPR-Cas, they were eventually uh, uh, able to completely correct uh, the gene mutation and provide a healthy uh, uh, embryo that initially had a gene that would have made it uh, prone for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, of course, this is not possible yet today, but it shows where the uh, years to come may go to, and it shows that genetic diseases in the future will be treatable as we treat today patients with uh, uh, pharmacological agents. So 
this is a summary of what I learned in Switzerland and in the UK. It was a real pleasure and honor to give this lecture. The future is bright if you aim high. And I think particularly in adult congenital heart disease, you should do so and learn from the other winners. And then it will be beneficial for you, but particularly for your patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Thomas, for this uh, fantastic and talk and so timely for us. Uh, with the opportunity and the challenge of moving to the next phase, which is uh, lumping, I guess. Uh, and um, um, from uh, all the value of uh, descriptive work, prognostic work, mechanistic work that has uh, taken place over the years to uh, start testing hypotheses, uh, um, gathering evidence, so there is more uh, of it in our practice. Um, it is not customary that you take questions for this kind of talk, uh, Thomas. Yes, I understand. I hope you're okay with this. That I'm, I'm fine, perfect. Yeah, uh, we have to wait, as I said repeatedly, for two years for a face-to-face -face celebration. And we'll have the meeting at the World College of Physicians in September of 2022. And we'll have the big celebration of the Royal Institute of British Architectures with the same theme of the London 60s uh, with a Liverpool band. And we'll have you uh, back to this. Uh, we'll have you the dates. Uh, in good time, so you stay with us. Very much appreciated, Thomas. Thank you very much. It was an honor and pleasure to be here. Absolutely fantastic. We'll have a short break for 10 minutes, colleagues, and then we have the ask 